Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui in Beijing. The arbitral tribunal in The Hague will announce its ruling on the South China Sea arbitration case on July the 12th. The United States has publicly pressed China to accept the ruling, but former Chinese state counselor Dai Bingguo said recently in Washington that the upcoming arbitration ruling amounts to nothing more than a piece of paper. Why does the U.S. continually press China over the South China Sea disputes? How will it affect China-U.S. relations? And is there any solution in sight to the South China Sea dispute? To discuss these issues and more today, I'm pleased to be joined here by Dr. Su Ge, President of the China Institute of International Studies, and Professor Zhu Chenghu from the National Defense University. Also, Richard Hidarian, an assistant professor from the De La Salle University in Manila, will join our discussion via telephone interview. Before we get started, let's look at this. For decades, it has been a sea of peace, but now Chinese and American analysts fear the South China Sea could become a flashpoint for military conflict. Because of some、uh, hawk school, so hawk persons, birds、uh, of our two countries, United States and China, they pretend to produce a crisis of、uh, South China Sea. We have not heard enough from the civilians, and maybe heard too much from the military on the United States side. The Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies co-sponsored this dialogue with the U.S. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. The goal to calm tensions in the South China Sea. The rhetoric of a few people in the U.S. has become blatantly confrontational. How would you feel if you were Chinese and read in a newspaper or watch on TV reports and the footages about U.S. aircraft carriers, naval ships, and fighter jets flexing muscles right at your doorstep, and hear a senior U.S. military official telling the troops to be ready to fight tonight? The symposium comes just one week before the Hague decides a case the Philippines filed against China. Over the Nansha Islands in the South China Sea, Manila and Beijing have repeatedly tried to resolve conflicting claims over territories the Filipinos call the Spratly Archipelago. The Philippines took China to court over them in 2013. Now, a five-judge panel will decide whether these territories are islands. Rocks are entitled to waters just 12 nautical miles away. Islands can claim waters 200 nautical miles from their shores. There's a high likelihood that many of these features are going to be declared not islands. Um, they're going to be called rocks or low tide elevations. Those islands, or rocks, or even low tide elevations, are belong to China. So it doesn't matter whether it should be viewed as islands or rocks or low tide elevations. Wu Shichuan runs the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. He says China's historical rights to these waters date back more than 2,200 years. To identify its territorial waters, China began using a U-shaped nine-dash line on maps in 1946. Welcome to our dialogue here, gentlemen.、Um, Mr. Dai Bingguo, former state councillor, delivered、uh, a keynote presentation in Carnegie, and.、Uh, For 95 percent of the time, he said a lot of、uh, constructive things about the U.S.-China relationship,、mm -hmm. but he seems to be remembered only for one sentence: that the upcoming arbitration would be nothing more than a piece of paper. I mean, this <laughs> seems to be pretty tough. Also, he said,、uh, "We don't, we don't, I, I don't. I hate to say we don't give a damn about the ten、mm -hmm. aircraft carriers, but it, that's something like that. It's very、mm -hmm. tough." Statement from Dai Bingguo. What do you think of his、uh, attitude there? Well, as you rightfully have、uh, put it, now the、uh, arbitral tribunal in the Hague is going to announce is going to announce a、uh, so-called、uh, decision. It's going to be eye-catching, and I'm sure it's going to arouse new questions.、Uh, but I I think that、uh, it's not going to alter. Or change one important historic fact and legal basis. That is, the Chinese were the first to discover the islands and shoals in the South China Sea, and China was the first country to stage to exercise effective administrative con control. That is, to exercise sovereignty. So, according to international law. So these islands belong to China. So I don't think、uh, the whatever decision、uh, the court is going to announce, it's not going to change the very fact. 
What do you think of uh, Mr. Dabinger's very tough statement about the piece of paper? I think there are three points. Number one, what he said is the reflection of the his,、uh, historical facts. That is, South China Sea, especially those islands and reefs and shores, belong to China. Secondly, his remarks represented the views of the most people in China. And the third is that、uh, he sent a signal to the United States:、mm. do not try to get the water muddled, and do not make further provocation in South China Sea. I think this. Are the three major messages he presented to the world? Are you both concerned that the two countries are likely to go to war over the South China Sea, since two aircraft carrier fleet are converging in the South China Sea, and we're going to hold military maneuvers in uh, uh, Xishan and Nanxia,、uh, integral parts of the South China Sea, and hence we have the standoff between the two militaries.、Hmm. Well, United States and China are two. Uh, big countries, important、uh, nations in the world, and we have lots in our relations to take care.、Uh, I think that for the United States and China, the most important thing is for both countries to look at the general picture, rather than have the eyes focus too close on the canvas. We have economic interests. We have international relations, so many issues to talk、uh, a- a- about. We have cultural uh, uh, exchanges and so on. But I think in most recent times,、uh, certain third-party factors have、uh, caught the attention of the of the international audience, and、uh, certain issues have, in a sense, have. Uh, uh, Well, kidnapped U.S.-China relations. Well, well, the White House, of course,、uh, the、U- U.S. government, the, one,、uh, uh, the official, has said that U.S. wants to lead the world for another、uh, century, and U.S. military wants to see more upsets or more incidents in certain areas, so that the Congress it will be more easy、uh, it will,、uh, for the Congress to pass certain acts. In favor of the so-called military-industrial complex, right? So I think this picture is very complicated for the U.S. administration. Now they have a, a new strategy called rebalancing Asia. It ch- altered its、uh, focus of its national strategy on terrorism. Now it deals with the emerging international powers, including China. So I think in the in the whole area, United States wants to show to its allies that we are still the number one. So when you take a look at of all these uh, uh, pictures, you see a very complicated picture. But that being said, I'm not totally pessimistic about U.S.-China relations. China relations, we have problems. We have problems, in, including the South China Sea, but the problems are not all pictures, not all, not everything about U.S.-China relations.、Uh, General Zhu,、um, Professor David Lampton said、uh, one year or so ago that、uh, South China Sea would be the tipping point for the trip, and uh, uh, look at the、uh, concentration of the military forces in the South China Sea. Do you see? The imminent danger of having the outbreak of hostilities between the two militaries, and do you think China is ready、uh, to push、uh, to fend off any threats to our national security in this region? I agree to、uh, David Lampton to、uh, some extent, but I believe that the two military actions at the present—I mean, the conversion of the two aircraft carriers in South China Sea and the military exercise launched by the PLA Navy—are two. Exercise、uh, two military actions of different nature because the convergence of the、uh, two aircraft carriers by the U.S. Navy is actually sure for muscle to China, with an intention to force China to make compromises on the disputes of territory and uh, uh, and uh, other things. And the second is to force China to accept the、uh, the ruling of the、uh, arbitration、uh, tribunal. These are the major purposes. While China's exercises is actually a pre-planned, a routine exercise, 
contacted in South China Sea, but not close to the uh, Spratly Island, but in uh, Shisha Island. I believe that the two actions are two totally different in nature. I'm confident that uh, the two militaries can restrain themselves from uh, engaging in a conflict or hostility in South China Sea because we Chinese are not willing to fight and the Americans, I think, are not well prepared. At least they haven't finished their deployment for a total war between China and the United States. And furthermore, I don't think he has enough bases, enough uh, military assets here. Therefore, I don't believe that we will have a hostility here. If a hostility happens between China and the United States, I think it's very, very difficult for us to control the escalation of the actions between the two sides. Mm. Well, uh, no one in the world uh, would be convinced that the two biggest economies are ready to have a shoe down militarily. But let me talk to uh, but Dr. Richard Hidarian, a professor, an assistant professor from uh, University of Manila, for his comments on uh, implications of the upcoming uh, arbitration from The Hague. Hello. Hi. Ni hao. Uh, good evening. Hi, Richard. Uh, what's your expectation for the upcoming arbitration ruling? Well, I think most experts uh, expect the arbitration verdict to be uh, broadly unfavorable to China, but no one knows to what extent because. So far, we only know that uh, the arbitral tribunal has exercised jurisdiction on seven out of 15 items that the Philippines has filed against China, and most of these items really have to do more with uh, bilateral differences between the countries in the disputed waters. For instance, the nature of the disputed features, whether they're land, rocks, or atolls, or islands, or for instance, the ecological impact of China's reclamation activities, or the allegations that China has um, mishandled some of the Filipino fishermen operating in the area. But I think the more important items that the Philippines uh, has filed against China was the validity of China's 9 dash line claim and its historical rights doctrine. There's no assurance that the court has even exercised jurisdiction on them or whether there will be a positive merit on them uh, as far as the Philippines' position is concerned. But I think many people believe that there will be enough in that verdict uh, to portray somehow a negative light uh, as far as China is concerned. But nonetheless, I think uh, there are some interesting developments in the last uh, few weeks. The Philippines now has a new president, uh, President Rodrigo. Uh, yeah, excuse president. me, that, that would be and my I'll second question. Um, Richard, what changes sorry. will the newly elected president, uh, Mr. Rodi Duterte, bring? Uh, what changes will he bring to the situation in the South China Sea? Right. I mean, since the Philippines uh, uh, initiated this arbitration case, of course, it's also very important what the Philippines will do with the verdict if it's favorable to the Philippines. Of course, uh, the United States and its allies for sure will try to use the verdict as a legal justification for conducting more aggressive freedom of navigation operations uh, against China and its occupied land features in the South China Sea. But, it's, but much will also depend on what the Philippines will do. So Rodrigo Duterte is very notorious around the world for being a foul-mouthed person or talking tough. But actually, when it comes to international politics, when it comes to relations with China, he sounds very much like a pragmatic, like a reasonable diplomatic person. Uh, so I think when it comes to Duterte, what is important for him is engagement with China, is development ties with China, and therefore what he seeks after the arbitration is a soft landing, a quote-unquote soft landing. Perhaps what that could mean is that if China agrees to give certain concessions to the Philippines, for instance, allowing Filipino fishermen to have easier access to some of the contested land features like Scarborough Shoal, or China will not impose, let's say, an exclusion zone or ABIZ in the Spratly chain of islands, then perhaps in exchange Duterte is willing to not release a very strongly worded statement after the arbitration so that he paves the way for normalization of bilateral high-level negotiations, which has been strained in the last few years. Uh, so uh, just recently, the Chinese ambassador in Manila met President Duterte, and I think if you look at President Duterte's statements since the campaign period, look at his statements today, they're broadly consistent. He wants to make sure that no country goes to war, and his feeling is that the last thing that the Philippines needs to do is to further provoke tensions in the region, and that is why the arbitration should not be used to provoke China into greater aggressiveness, but arbitration should be used as a test case 
to show that the Philippines actually wants better relations with China and that China is also willing to give the Philippines certain concession in exchange. Thank you very much, Richard, for being with us. <laughs> you are watching Dialogue with uh, Mr. Zhuge and General Zhu Tenghu. We are discussing the latest development in the South China Sea. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <coughs> Gentlemen, <coughs> Um, when you listen to what Richard said on behalf of uh, the uh, scholars in Manila, mm -hmm. and particularly mm -hmm. when most who follow the development in the South China Sea, particularly the arbitration in the Hague, would uh, make the conclusion that the ruling would not necessarily be in China's favor, President Duterte, the newly, ele newly elected president in the Philippines, uh, is likely to use this mandate, quote unquote, in his hand to either persuade China to go to the negotiating table or to provoke China. What do you think is the most likely uh, option on the table? Mm. Let me say this. The uh, former president of the Philippines uh, has initiated this uh, case through the uh, tribunal uh, court. I think there are, it must be said that there are certain which are not under the jurisdiction of the court. Number one issue is a country's territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty. The other issue is the maritime, uh, maritime delimitation. Because these issues are not su supposed to be uh, ruled uh, by, by the court. That's why China has uh, cited uh, item 298 of the UNCLOS that the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas. As China has declared that it will be excluded from whatever rulings will not be, we are not going to recognize, not going to participate, uh, uh, participate in this. And of course, we are not entitled to carry anything out of, the, of, of this. That's why, uh, as you said at the outskirts, that uh, the former state uh, councillor Dai Bing Guo said in Washington that it's just a piece of uh, waste paper. But that being said, I think the, uh, the scholar from the uh, Philippines has also mentioned that there is the new uh, situation in the Philippines that the new president uh, who has said uh, something conciliatory uh, to the situation. Uh, I would like to say that uh, through negotiations to settle a question this deep, this emotionally charged, the best or the only means is through bilateral negotiations and, and the peaceful dialogue. Because through peaceful dialogues, there is no loser. War, confrontation, there is no winner. So that has been what China has all along proposed. It's not something that just has come out fresh from the Filipino side. In fact, the uh, American lawyers that the Manila employed uh, for this uh, ruling of the Hague uh, were clearly aware of the sensitivity on sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity that China is concerned with. In fact, they have been challenging the Nine Dash Line, mm -hmm. and they've been challenging the low tide elevations. Uh, they thought that the, in doing that, they could bypass the sensitivity of the Chinese concerns. What do you think of uh, the uh, latest development? Do you think uh, uh, we are concerned has been have been indeed challenged? Uh, of course, uh, it will be a challenge for China, and I believe that, uh, as uh, Professor Soka mentioned just now, a lot of things are out of the business of the uh, tribunal for ruling. I, I believe that uh, it is quite clear, but uh, I, in my understanding, the, the ruling or the, the verdict will not the, the interest of uh, China were not favorable to China. I think we Chinese will have to be prepared for this. Mm -hmm. Now the problem lies in the fact whether the new president of the United of the Philippines will come and sit down on the negotiation table to negotiate with China. I think as Professor Su mentioned just now, it is the only way and the best way for us to settle the territorial disputes. Many people would believe uh, the uh, upcoming arbitration will be viewed as a turning point, mm -hmm. if not a game changer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it, mm -hmm. it sounds a little bit too optimistic. Let's yeah. look at a more realistic uh, issue yeah. concerning the future of the Asia-Pacific region. Yeah. 
Uh, Professor Hugh White uh, uh, comes from the National University of Australia. His recent article generated a lot of attention, particularly his debate with uh, Kurt Campbell, former Under Secretary of the first term of the Obama's administration. He said in his article to criticize uh, Kurt Campbell, uh, the United States failed to uh, outline the objectives uh, in the pivot to Asia. Secondly, uh, he, Professor White says in the article, uh, the core issue concerning the future of Asia is uh, China will be the winner. The mm. United States will play a secondary role. It sounds like a zero-sum game. The United States, of course, finds it extremely uneasy to accept his uh, arbitration. Good, good. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, cross one, the arbitral uh, case is a uh, is an interesting one. Because it's not a an, an isolated case, uh, you're right. Behind this case, and you can see so many uh, players, actors. Probably the most important one is the United States. Uh, the most. Are you powerful. suggesting clearly that the United States has been the architect of the security scenario in Asia? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the United States is the architect for the future for the politics uh, in it, but I think that the United States has been a, a very important player in all these things related to, uh, to the uh, tribunal case ruling. Uh, and then, as for as for the rulings itself, just now you mentioned uh, uh, Professor Hugh, Hugh White about the U.S.-China relations. Well, that reminds me of something about the mass media. For instance, now we all read things about U.S.-China relations from the mass media. But now, when you read the mass media about traffic in a certain city, of course, so many cars pass by, travel, and uh, back and forth. But in the media, you see more uh, reports about accidents. In U.S.-China relations, the same thing. We have so many cargo ships going on and on, and, and we have so many flights every day. But when you talk about U.S. relations, the most eye-catching things are the two aircraft carriers are now sent to the, to the region. And, uh, and uh, I think I, I'm afraid, the General Zhu, the two <laughs> aircraft carriers have been sent by the Pentagon to the South China Sea to protect what they call freedom of navigation and mm -hmm. overflight. Do you think uh, these two things are really in danger, the uh, navigation and overflight? No, no, it has never been. I mean, the freedom of navigation in this area has never been challenged by a state actor in uh, South China Sea. So it is uh, only a pretext for the uh, showing of muscle to China by selling the two aircraft carriers simultaneously to this region. Do you two guys uh, uh, agree that sending the two aircraft carriers uh, actually implies the understatement that we are the big, we, we are the big guy, we are mm. the architect of the security scenario and therefore you will have to act accordingly uh, in, in the framework of rules that we set forth. It's mm. a rule-based world, you have to play by the rules. So sending the aircraft carrier is like uh, uh, cops patrolling the waters. Mm -hmm. Well, when we study the international relations, I remember a professor in the university in the United States has said, rightfully, he said, now we are in an equal world. Some can countries got to be more equal than others. Now, look at the South China Sea situation. China was the first to discover these islands. We were the first to exercise administrative control. When China regained these islands during the Second World War, was after the Second World War, we even received assistance from the U.S. administration. We even borrowed American destroyers in order to get these islands back. And of course, the U.S. later adjusted its policies. Now, that being said, what I'm saying is that uh, now you, uh, you, when you look at these, uh, 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 when you look at the uh, uh, region and the uh, U.S. and, and China, we have uh, more to, to talk uh, uh, with each other and we simply cannot focus on, on, on our eyes on all these uh, uh, problems. When, so we, when we look at the general relationship between the United States and China, uh, voices are divide, I mean, uh, public opinions are divided in both cases, China and the United States, so with some uh, taking side, uh, I mean, taking the views of uh, optimism, the other pessimism, but 
uh, Kurt Campbell yeah. says in his book that what the United States pursues in the pivot to Asia policy is a shared principle and the rules that might hopefully be agreed upon by, by China and mm -hmm. the United States. And therefore, this relationship took decades to construct and would not be easy to destroy. Uh, he sounds a little bit constructive, do you buy his idea? Yeah, I agree with him. Uh, I think every country will have to according to the rules and the order. And I believe that the China is not challenging the rules and the order. Now, the problem lies on the interpretation of the rules and the order. For mm -hmm. example, as Professor Suga mentioned just now, how about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Cairo Declaration and the Postan Proclamation? Are they rules or the order of the Second World War? Should, should we give it up right now? So these are the principles. So on these principles, I think the China and the United States will have to discuss together. So you, we will have to follow the rules of uh, freedom of navigation. We will have to respect the interests of the United States in South China Sea. And we will have to try to set disputes by uh, means or negoti through negotiation. I think all this we respect what about the, all of those, the historical rights, etc. So this should also be respected. In this area, we see different levels of economic uh, uh, development, uh, uh, legacies of the colonialism, the imperialism, uh, the war history, whatever, memories about the war. Now, above all, in the wake of the Cold War, the United States still maintains uh, five treaty allies uh, in this region. Uh, there is one, one strong voice uh, saying, hey, these uh, treaty uh, alliances help stabilize the region, and China is the biggest beneficiary if you look at what China has gained since its entry into the WTO back in the year 2001, do you agree? Or do I you think, think uh, we should trust the United States and continue to use the five treaty alliances to benefit our own free trade? I think that uh, when you look at the history, both uh, politically, economically, culturally, with the United States, uh, between the United States and China, when these countries have co cooperation, both countries would benefit. Now, in Chinese relations uh, and U.S. relations, uh, and uh, there is a common saying that uh, you need to use a pair of binoculars. You should not just close, focus eyes too close on the canvas. And that is to say that uh, uh, what the U.S., uh, China, we have we have a common interest in the area. We have joint responsibilities to maintain stability, and peace in the region. But uh, too much close up. Uh, uh, reconnaissance that's not going to help the problem in the, this situation. Thank you very much. With that, we come to the end of this edition of Dialogue on the South China Sea. We'll keep our discussion open. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>